I do not think leftism can survive in this world if it is defended predominantly by its loudest advocates right now. Because its loudest advocates in America are psychotic idiot children. So yeah, I do find myself agreeing with liberals on a lot of stuff. Not, mind you, because I don't have better ideas than them. I do, and I've argued for them. But because the other ideas that are being thrown their way are so bad that I can't risk the left being pulled down with them. I want you guys to have a better understanding of liberals so you can better critique them. I don't want you to be complacent like the liberal. I want you to know what you're up against. Because otherwise you run the risk of being one of those internet lefties who will unironically make arguments like how are Democrats better than Republicans on trans issues when Florida is passing anti-trans bills? That is a real take that I have seen tens of thousands of people like and hundreds of thousands of people see and have burned into their minds. Say for the sake of argument, there's this... Call him a provocateur? A conservative who makes his living off being a public figure, saying scandalously evil things in public because controversy equals attention, and attention equals brand recognition. This is Milo Yiannopoulos. He doesn't directly name people, that's Milo. He gets his writing gigs and interviews and guest spots, sometimes because people agree with the awful things he says. More often it's because he gets views. His economy runs on engagement and... I hate clicks are still clicks. One revenue stream is speaking engagements, the college campus circuit. Fans at, let's say, UC Emeryville invite him as a guest lecturer. But UCE is broadly a progressive campus, which means his presence there would likely provoke a lot of outrage. Maybe even a- You guys remember this? The era of the culture war being centered around people battling over guest speaking spots at universities was by far my least favorite. I despised this entire process. Protest. And a protest would be pretty flippin' sweet. Protest means local news coverage. Maybe more than local. Hell, the conservative media machine loves taking stories like this and blowing them up to national importance. If he plays his cards right, he could get his words in front of millions of people instead of just the student body of UC Emeryville. Of course he's gonna take that gig. This is the reason why, for the most part during that era, I was opposed to people showing up to protest. And I still get emails from time to time, people saying like, hey, like, this hateful speaker is gonna be at our campus, should we protest them? And my answer generally is, I really don't think so, because they're almost always going to benefit from it. I think that ignoring it is better in almost all cases, because they're doing it for attention. But well, this video goes into it. Hold on. But the progressive students at UCE are wise to his tricks. They've seen him pull this stunt at other UCs, Stockton, Bakersfield, Vacaville. So they make the decision, we're not going to protest. We're just going to let him speak, let the boy stamp his feet, and in a month, no one will even remember he was here. As the date approaches and the provocateur sees he's not getting the response he wants, he starts hinting things on social media, trying to bait a reaction. Psst. Psst. Hey. I'm gonna make jokes about the Holocaust. I'm gonna say Americans treated their slaves well. Nothing. So he ups the ante, makes it personal. I'm gonna put up pre-transition photos of your trans students. I'm gonna out the queer students I've seen on Grindr. I'm gonna name which of your students I think are illegal immigrants. Student body's like, bro, do your worst. Nobody's falling for it until one student's like- Right off the bat, this characterization is inaccurate. White college liberals are incapable of not taking the bait. I have never in my life seen a time where a provocateur would do stuff like this and the college liberals would go, yeah, we're not falling for it. That's what I say they should do, but they never did it, which always pissed me off. Um, they would take the bait every single time. Uh, hold up. He's gonna dox immigrants in front of his audience of white nationalist gun nuts? And we're just gonna let him? You know some of his fans were in Charlottesville, right? What we're seeing here is a game of chicken between one group of white conservative reactionaries and one group of, let's be honest, mostly white liberals, for whom the stakes are who gets paid attention to. No, so all right, like the IQ of this is plummeting rapidly, but we'll get to the... There are so many things wrong right off the bat, but we'll, we'll get to it. The provocateur doesn't have the ammunition nor the optics to attack privileged liberals directly, so he pokes and prods at various social minorities whom privileged liberals are supposed to care about, until he gets a reaction. Going after people of color is a pure Xanatos gambit for his fans. Either they get a protest and a national audience hears their reactionary rhetoric, or there's no protest and they get to f*** with some immigrants. 
And because white liberals are largely ignorant to the threat posed to those immigrants, white liberals are not great at assessing the full scope of the danger. Often enough, this remains to them an argument about ideas and principles. No. Oh my god, there are so many things wrong with this right off the bat. So, first of all, loudly protesting and showing up to a provocateur's college appearance empirically increases the danger to everyone involved. Obviously. If it was just Milo Yiannopoulos at a college speaking to an audience of his own fans without much engagement from others, the danger, the likelihood of people following through on what he said are remarkably low. Whereas the enormous amount of tension and fear baiting that he would get from broader social media and conservative media, if they do show up in protest, would increase the danger to immigrants and to Jewish people. Like Milo Yiannopoulos showing up to a college campus and just saying, you know, I'm going to dock some immigrants on its own has, let's be real here, very little material threat to those immigrants because it's not really something that can be followed through on without the overwhelming weight of, um, a, uh, a, 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 you know, a conservative movement behind it of, of a significant amount of attention. In fact, if anything bad happened to an immigrant following Milo Yiannopoulos' threats without there having been a big provocative protest, that would actually be a pretty massive optical loss for the right. Because it would basically mean that despite all of his provocations, you, you guys realize the whole point of a provocateur is to provoke. If you're doing the provocateur bit, and you fail to provoke somebody, but then you run up and punch them anyway, you've kind of lost the game, haven't you? Whereas if you try to provoke somebody and you get them involved and then you fight or you punch them, well, you've succeeded. That's the point. So I don't like the assumption from Innuendo Studios that you're making queer communities or immigrant communities or Jewish communities safer by taking the bait. You're not protecting them. Showing up to a protest doesn't protect them. It's not as though violence against immigrants or queer people or Jewish people was going to be done at that protest, right? Like, it's not as though the protest, uh, or sorry, it's not as though Milo Yiannopoulos speaking at a college campus, it was going to be like to a group of 500 death soldiers and they're all going to spread out in a wave and you have to be there to contain them or they'll get at the immigrants that were doxxed or anything like that. That stuff happens stochastically and in a broader context and the likelihood of that stochastic terrorism taking place is exacerbated by the attention you know the point that i'm getting at is that i don't like the idea that engagement with the provocateur protects people because it doesn't secondly i really don't like the idea that these white college students who are protesting against milo yiannopoulos are liberal like, you know, like banal, liberal, oh, it's about the idea types. No, it's not. The kinds of people, we're talking about Berkeley right now. The kinds of people who are doing these counter-protest work at Berkeley are not liberals at the most, or sorry, at the very least, they are like very politically engaged liberals who have a higher understanding of these issues than your average. They're not like wine moms. A lot of them are leftists. There are so many leftists at Berkeley, white or otherwise. I also don't like the idea, and this is a complete straw man, that it's only white people who are making the argument to not take the bait. Like, like that it's just this uh, group of white people talking over all the queer people, the Jewish people, the racial minorities, and like they're the ones who are putting forward their banal, I, like, you know, oh, it's about ideas and principles. I just, this isn't what happened at Berkeley, guys. Berkeley, the place where there were actual like black block protesters showing up to these college speaking tours, this was not a battle between white reactionaries and white liberals with minorities being the ball that they play with. It, it, that's a radical oversimplification that allows Innuendo Studios to take the moral high ground over people who think not taking the bait is a safer strategy, which it is. Shouldn't we not accept the presented options? The options are protest or let immigrants die. Th that is a false dichotomy. The idea that protesting makes immigrants safer or that not protesting necessarily means sacrificing the immigrants is ridiculous. That is not the dichotomy. That's not a real dichotomy that's present here. It's more complicated than that. To them, they are but words. Until someone gets hit by a car or shot and then it's who could have predicted. 
The provocateur's animating force is- N No, no? Wait, white liberal college students were arguing who could have predicted violence would have happened at Charlottesville? See, this is a complete straw man. The, the, they're painting the anti-engagement white college Not student. Hatred of oh, sorry. White college student as some kind of like ultra naive liberal who doesn't understand that the right can be violent, which is ridiculous. It's, it's just, it's, it's just anti-reality. It's not real. Of people of color. It's hatred of white liberals, just as white liberals animating force is less advocacy for people of color than moral victory over conservatives. Massive straw man. Liberals being less combative people are generally less animated by moral victory over their opposition than they are by the feeling that they are being beneficiaries of the vulnerable. Liberals are way more motivated morally by the idea that they're promoting their ideology of egalitarianism than they are by beating the right. That's the reason why owning the libs is a catchphrase from the right, but not owning the cons being a catchphrase for liberals. Yeah, I, I just, I disagree. Most of this disagreement will stem from a mischaracterization of liberal behavior, which I find very frustrating. You have to understand how liberals act in order to better push them towards your desired um, behaviors. Liberals are really smug, though. Is that true? Conservatives are really smug. I don't remember the last time I actually saw that much smugness from liberals. No, 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 chat. Think for a second. I'm not just talking about, like, the MSNBC wine mom, wine mom smugness. Go on social media right now and look at behavior from liberals versus conservatives and tell me who looks more smug. Seriously, haven't we spent the entire time that I've spent on this channel talking about how leftists want to be smug? How they want to be the smarmiest, smuggest person in the death camp. They're not concerned with material change. They're concerned with analysis and being smarter than the liberals when they die. Liberal smugness is real, but it's absolutely not the defining characteristic of liberals. That would be complacency. The idea that liberals are ultra super duper smug is, let's be real, a conservative straw man that leftists promote because we want to distinguish ourselves from the liberals. Are there smug liberals? Absolutely. But do you really think that that's like their defining characteristic when compared to conservatives? When liberals are smug, they will say stuff like, well, of course there are uh, bad policy outcomes in Texas. Maybe the people should have voted for someone who wouldn't take away women's rights. When conservatives are smug, Donald Trump threatens to withhold COVID aid from blue states. The level of smugness and partisanship and we're better than you on the conservative side has reached a point where politicians literally are QAnon supporters. They're not just smug anymore. They think they deserve to inherit the earth over you. And 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 the liberal, the liberal what? Patronizes with their wealth? The average conservative voter is wealthier than the average liberal voter. I just I don't like the I don't like taking this bait. Oh, these smug coastal elites are are are, are being smug towards middle America. Guys. The coastal elites are conservatives. The wealthiest people in Seattle, San Francisco, New York City, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Chicago, the executives are conservatives. It's the people who live there, who live in the oppressively high rent prices, uh, in the food deserts, with the policing, those are the liberals or leftists. This is something that I had to shift on because I used to believe more in the liberal smugness, and that's not to say it doesn't exist. It certainly, certainly does, and you should call it out when you see it, but I don't like the idea that it's the defining characteristic. Here, Innuendo Studios is arguing the defining characteristic of the liberal is a desire to achieve moral victory over conservatives, but liberals are complacent and non-combative, by definition. That's the whole end of civilization thing, you know? I don't know. I, I, I just, I, it, all of this fits into a, a set of prescriptions that I just don't think map onto patterns of behavior as well as they used to anymore. Maybe, oh, to be clear, by the way, 20 years ago, that would be correct. All of this would be correct 20 years ago. Because 20 years ago, the height of liberal activism was smugly correcting President Bush on his pronunciation of the word nuclear and moral victory over uh, conservatives did take priority over defensive minorities, predominantly because moral victory was being smarter than conservatives, which liberals are. But that's not the case anymore. Well, they still are smarter than conservatives, but that's not what moral victory means. Every liberal already knows they're smarter than Donald Trump. That's not, like, impressive anymore. They're not trying to prove it, really. They're mostly trying to point out how evil he is. And they usually do that by using uh, minority groups as tokens. But that's a, that's a different thing. It's a low bar.
I agree. Bosh, the easiest way to see this is look at how conservatives talk about New York, shithole, racial slurs, etc., versus liberals talking about rural America. Should have voted for a politician who wouldn't cut their health care. Yeah, no, that's true. And, uh, the most liberal smugness I see is when people are saying something correct, but kind of like ignorant or presumptuous. Hey, maybe Texas should have voted blue. Yeah, I agree. Maybe they should have. Though, let's not, you know, it's not quite that simple. <laughs> it's, it's more complicated. Liberals get too much hate from leftists in general, IML. Well, that's that's always been my argument, which is that leftists are more obsessed with distinguishing themselves from liberals than they are from combating fascism. Look at how Innuendo Studios has to pretend that your average Berkeley student protester is some kind of, like, Clintonite liberal who believes that this is a battle for ideas when trying to protest against Milo Yiannopoulos. What are you smoking? That isn't what happened. I remember what happened. That wasn't what was happening. I mean, you remember the video footage, right? There were black bloc protesters all over Berkeley. And we are largely talking about Berkeley here, by the way, because that was the epicenter of this particular phenomena of like conservative provocateur student. But like, ah, oh, yeah, these are all like presumptuous white liberals. The funny thing is, is that I would actually argue that the real problem we had with white overrepresentation in this particular scenario was with the leftists, not the liberals. Seriously, there's a reason why if you go to a lot of college campuses or just like racially diverse groups in general, you'll notice that the idea of Antifa being a bunch of LARPy white boys is a way more common sentiment with black and Latin liberals than it is with white liberals, or any leftists. Innuendo Studios is a dipshit, but to be clear, I think that most of his videos are excellent. This is the one that irked me. Neither side acknowledges people of color as entities in this fight. Absolutely delusional. The idea that student protesters don't recognize minorities or marginalized groups, you just literally like anti-true. Go to college campuses. Like, I promise you, okay? It's like, that's, that's, that's so silly. That's so silly to say. They're viewed as tools for getting white people what they want. At, like, literally, at, like, trying to force an equivocacy between Milo Yiannopoulos and liberal white college students. It's such a desperate reach to try to smear liberals for, like, no reason. And their suffering is viewed as an acceptable byproduct. Uh, yep, that's true. Your average Berkeley student protester and Milo Yiannopoulos both have equal understandings of the acceptability of the suffering of minority groups. Notice here he is presuming that not taking the bait from Milo Yiannopoulos equals more suffering for minorities when the opposite is demonstrably true. You've maybe heard the phrase in the game of patriarchy, women are not the opposing team, they are the ball. Well, in the game of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, Sorry. minorities are not the opposing team. They are the cars, store windows, and newspaper kiosks that get wrecked when the home team loses. Or when the home team wins. It's the Eagles fan view of oppression. Yep, it's all, it's all the same. Milo Yiannopoulos and neo-Nazis are the same as Berkeley student protesters in that they're just all, both fully accepting of damage to minority groups as long as they get to play ball in... In this imaginary world where Berkeley students ignored the protests. Is this guy a centrist? I don't get it. Yeah, you'd think so, but no, believe it or not, he's a leftist. Keep in mind, we're still operating in this, like, we're, we're operating in this universe right now where students avoid taking the bait from Milo Yiannopoulos. And make no mistake, weaponizing or disregarding students of color is still racism. But it's racism of a kind most white people have trouble recognizing, or... First of all, weaponizing a marginalized group in a shared struggle is absolutely not racism at all. Like, if, if, if you have a multiracial coalition and both groups are working together to use their respective social positions and arguments to advantage themselves in the pursuit of a shared agenda, that's not racism. That's strategy. Also, again, like, none of this is real. Why does it feel like he's just talking for students of color? Because ironically, even though he accuses liberals of being primarily motivated by wanting the moral high ground, that's exactly what he's doing. He has to rewrite history to make it seem as though the era of conservative provocateurs in college campuses was a phenomena of white liberals saying, yeah, don't take the bait, guys, while marginalized people in the community are like, whoa, wait, I think we should take the bait, actually. I think we should go and protest, which is just not what happened to speak with a sharper edge, that white people often refuse to acknowledge? From the white provocateur who does not hate minorities directly, but is willing to utilize the hate- Milo Yiannopoulos hates minorities directly, and to suggest otherwise is unironically racist. 
I know that in the desperate effort to equivocate, or sorry, not equivocate, equate white liberals and Milo Yiannopoulos, we have to like water him down and worsen the white liberal. But I promise you, he hates liberal, or uh, he hates, well, he hates liberals, yeah. He hates minorities directly. He's a Nazi and pretending otherwise is not woke. Hatred of others to get what he wants from some white people who says, I will hurt them a lot just to hurt you a little. To the white liberal who does mental gymnastics to not come out and say, that is a black and brown sacrifice I'm willing to make. This is completely made up. This is literally, go to the college students at that time, or go to the, now that they're out of college, and ask, hey, were you and all the other white students there saying, I'm willing to sacrifice black and brown people as long as it means that I get to ignore Milo Yiannopoulos? You will not find a single human being alive who will cop to that because it didn't happen. Oh, no, he had literally a Nazi STL. Racism is not always a passion, but it is tolerable, usable, easy to disregard. In a white supremacist world... Mm -hmm. Liberal college student and MAGA hat guy together united in racism on the issue of Milo Yiannopoulos. It is the cost of doing business. Let me make it clear. Nothing about this is okay. Sorry. Now, the weaponizing of minority suffering is employed against many minoritized groups. I could be making this video about transphobia or homophobia, and while- Stop calling fascist Nazis. Milo Yiannopoulos is a Nazi. The password to his computer was Night of Long Knives, uh, then the year that Jews were expelled from England. He worked with, like, open Nazis to promote media. He's a Nazi. While many details would differ, I wouldn't even have to change my intro. Samuel R. Delaney, yeah, yeah, take a shot argues that misogyny is the oldest bigotry, and therefore the model on which all other bigotries are based. I'm focusing on institutional racism as my chief example, first, because this is America and the cup runneth over. Second, because in the 2016 election, the greatest indicator a person was going to vote Republican, more strongly correlated than being registered as a Republican, was racist sentiments. And third, because racism is a fundamental building block of fascism and a primary means of sowing discord on the left. But we'll get to that. I am going to curb my reflex. All, so all of this is correct. I have no issues, which is why I'm not saying anything. ...to make every alt-right playbook some kind of definitive statement. I do not have the last word on American racism. Soy, please stop. You should take it for granted as a presumption that if you say something about a subject, you are not making a super ultra final argument that nobody else can amend or correct. Allow your audience the, give your audience the grace and intelligence and good charity to assume they know that and quit doing this performative holding up your hands. I, a white man, I'm not the only person you should, like, come on. I, I don't, just say it, just say your shit, okay? If you want to hear about American racism from the people who experience it, here's a book. Here's f oh my god, yeah, dude, uh-huh, yep, oh, nice, Ibram X candy. Yeah, dude, you just slap your book, prove that you have the books by slapping Five them down. Books. Yep, mm-hmm, yep, you're so woke, bro, yeah. Don't just recommend specific sources or give any descriptions or give people any pointers because you know nobody's actually going to read it and you only did this to show that you own the books. You're such a good white ally, okay? You're so good, you're such a good white ally. That's so great. Like, no one's, none of, nobody in his audience is going to see this one camera pan and go like, Oh, wow, I will read that. Like, because you're not recommending them in a constructive way. Like, hey, read this book to get this specific perspective. You're just showing you have them. And I bet you're showing that you have them because these books are worn. These are library copies. Oh, shit, these are library copies. Is that better or worse? I don't know if that's better or worse. I don't know. Did he check these out just for this shot? Okay. What I bring to the table is, I have at this point... Is that Vosh? several decades experience being white? We need like an Exodia soy emote where if the soys pile up enough, it merges into like a like a five line stack giga soy that's like vibrating. And in trying to explicate white supremacy, it is sometimes worthwhile to look at it from the inside. It's always worth, why would you? You, everyone has a right to have opinions on r socially relevant topics. If you live in America, then you have an experience with American white supremacy from any side. It's, d d what? So my focus will be, what does whiteness mean to white people? American racial discourse has four principal white characters. On the far right end, you've got the guy white people picture when they hear the word racist. Your Klansman, your neo-Nazi, your suit and tie ethno-nationalist. This guy knows he's a racist, and he's proud of it. Next to the white supremacist, you've got the white collaborator. 
the politician, public figure, or businessman who does not agree with the white supremacist on paper, but will seek out their votes, attention, or money. So far, this is completely correct. Next to the collaborator, you've got the white moderate, people who ostensibly believe in racial justice as an end goal and are somewhat committed to bringing it about, but only with the cooperation of the white collaborator. It wouldn't be fair to do it without their consent, you see, and thus the white moderate spends a lot less time opposing collaborators than appealing to their better natures. They tend to operate on behalf of people of color rather than with them. We skipped the step. You guys notice that we skipped the step, guys? We went from open, overt, proud racist to racist collaborator, and now over here we have a liberal white moderate. Did we not skip the average conservative voter? The white collaborator agrees with the open racist internally and launders their behavior publicly. Are we suggesting then that the hundred million conservatives in this country are all privately in agreement with Richard Spencer and that they're just engaging in differing levels of moderation to launder those perspectives? That's psychotic. No. In reality, uh, the vast majority of people who align with racist ends are themselves probably more or less believers in at least a version of equality, but they're very susceptible to narratives and fear-mongering that make them easy targets for misinformation. Put it this way, guys. If there was no such group, why would conservatives spend all their time lying about race issues? If the only two groups of racists that they could appeal to politically were either open racists or collaborators with racists, why spend all their time trying to win over the votes of people with, who aren't by saying what they're doing isn't racist? There would be no need to launder anything. They could all be open. We're skipping a very important step here. Like, we're skipping the most important group to consider. But I do believe that Innuendo Studios is one of those types of people who doesn't really think there's much value in trying to win over the right. So it's possible that he genuinely does believe. I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I don't like the simplification because it's, it, it implies that there's no point. Plainly put, the cost of doing business maneuver is this group using this group to attack this group using people of color as their weapon of choice. It is white supremacy in the form of three groups of white people fighting amongst themselves. No, it's this group using this group to attack the minorities to appeal to the moderate conservative missing middle. They don't use these minority fear-mongering tactics in order to attack white liberals. They use them to convince people in the middle or people who are right-leaning to vote for them. That's the whole point of politics, is to get votes. Like, when white collaborationists and racists work together to fearmonger about immigrants, they're doing it in order to prey on the fears of moderate or conservative-leaning voters who don't think of themselves as explicitly racist, because if they did, they wouldn't need this narrative to convince them, would they? that immigration is scary, and therefore you need to vote for the candidate who will lock down the border wall. We're missing the point here, because the narrative that Innuendo Studios wants to promote is the idea that all of this is just white people playing ball with minorities. And it's just not true. There are plenty of things that white moderates and white liberals do that are racist and hurt minority groups. We don't have to make up new ones, you know? Finally, on the far opposite end, you have the honest-to-goodness anti-racist. And here we have it. Here we have the epitomization of the leftist moral high ground holding. The idea that you are either those groups or an Antifa black bloc anti-racist. And that's it. There's no way to be a progressive liberal. You can't be a good advocate on a wide majority. MLK Jr., wouldn't have been a part of this group, I suppose, because he didn't align with what then were considered radical tactics like uh, those of Malcolm X and the Black Panther Party. So I guess by this incredibly cut down definition, MLK Jr. would have been a liberal moderate for trying to work with and appeal to uh, majorities on both sides. This is a ridiculously simplified... Like, the, so the goal here is like that leftists are some kind of elite... Uh, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, 
outsider political group. Okay, look, I'm just going to say this. If you really believe that the that anti-racists are represented by or composed of people who look like this, then we've already lost. Sir, if 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 anti-racism is represented not by the common man, not by the Black Lives Matter protests where white and black and Hispanic people linked arms to protest in the tens of millions, but rather by the hyper minority of Antifa black bloc types. If this is what anti-racism looks like, then we've lost. It's so LARPy. It's so LARPy. The point the video is making is that only white people have politics. I actually do think you're kind of right. The idea that the minority group in question is just like a ball without agency to be tossed around by white groups, as though black people and Latin people and Asian people and whatever have not historically had a ton of influence on this. Think of queer rights, for example. Are queer people just a ball to be thrown around in the battle for their own rights? No? Stonewall was a riot. Gay people and trans people have been incredibly active participants in their own liberation. They're not just quietly being tossed about by the majority power groups. They're really active. I, of course, that doesn't mean that there aren't non-queer people who won't use them as like a token, but imagine this being applied to like, to like queer politics or trans politics right now, right? Right now, trans rights are being stripped aggressively by the right. But if you can imagine this dynamic being applied to trans people specifically, are there no allies to trans people who authentically represent their interests, who aren't like radical trans supporting activists, who aren't like Antifa types? Because the majority of Democrats vote in favor of trans rights. So where are they? Do you think the average liberal Democrat right now is only willing to pursue trans rights with the collaboration of Republican politicians? Think about that for a second, because that's the argument that's being made. There are a lot of Democrats out there, folks, and they're only willing to push for your rights as long as they can get it done with the collaboration of Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gates, or Ron DeSantis. Really? Is that true? Because that sounds psychotic. That's not true, even a little bit. But if your goal is to make it seem like all liberals are basically just the same as conservatives and that they're callously racist or bigoted and they treat the minority group as like a disposable political weapon and not as like a regular group of people, you know, if you make that up, then this would be how you'd promote that narrative. Does everyone understand where I'm coming at this from? This is like a nuanced criticism, so I need you guys to have your thinking caps on. The argument here is not that white liberals never make mistakes. That's all they make. And the argument is not that um, conservatives aren't a real threat. And what's more, the argument is not that leftism isn't great. It is. Which is why it's good that I'm the only real leftist. The argument is that this is a ridiculous, disingenuous oversimplification of how politics takes place with the goal of equating liberals and conservatives which is wrong. And yes, this is a self-defeating argument because the implicit argument here is that the only way to advocate for the rights of minorities is to break from the system entirely. But I gotta tell you guys, I know that might seem really tempting to be that kind of LARPer, but I promise you, trans people right now do not need you to break from the Democrat Party, the only powerful institution advocating for their rights and defending it in states they control, in order to go be some kind of lunatic moon political person, you know, is some sort of radical activist. Um, what they need, what you need to do, is build a massive coalition, a political bloc, which includes as many people as possible, including the hundreds of millions of people left out here. I want to propose an alternate model, the Onion model. Core activist supporters disengage hostile. Yeah, this is good, right here. Here we have the missing middle. Hostile would describe uh, the entire Republican Party. Disengaged would describe... Uh, pretty significant portion of the American population and also people who maybe vote Republican on incidental issues but aren't ideologically committed to their goals. Then we have supporters, which represents most of the Democrat Party and everyone in my community currently. Activists, which represent a significant portion of the Democratic Party and a lot of people in my community. And the core would represent both the group itself and people who are like locked in with it, which I would consider myself to be a part of. I mean, depending on the issue, I am a part of the core. I'm queer. But, you know, I think that's a much better model. Innuendo literally used this in the radicalization video, too. Well, ideological inconsistency is the norm for lefties with a bone to pick with liberals. Far opposite end, you have the honest-to-goodness anti-racist. 
where the racist will support white supremacy, the collaborator uphold white supremacy, and the moderate seek to reform white supremacy. Only We're really missing a lot of people here, man. The anti-racist is trying to get rid of it. And even they are not free from racial bias. Ah, ah, but even if you belong to this group, remember, remember, I'm aware of the fact that there are imperfections even with white leftists, remember. And if you tell one of them you are not free from racial bias, it's not guaranteed they will react well. It's just, if you're trying to fight white supremacy, they're the white folks you have the best odds with. Now, this little chorus line is not how white people typically frame the situation. We usually think of racism as a binary. Not how white people typically frame the situation. <laughs> Hold on. There are racists, and there are non-racists. In that framing, the provocateur is someone whose allegiance we get to debate. He willingly sacrifices people of color, but- No, no? Wait, white liberals are debating whether Milo Yiannopoulos is a racist? Wait, what? When? When, when was that a, a discourse? I didn't realize that was something that was up in the air. I thought that was pretty straightforward and not... And also, where is this nonsense of he does not personally hate minorities from? I'm serious. Innuendo Studios, if you see this video, where did you get the idea that Milo Yiannopoulos does not personally hate minorities from? He is a Nazi. And this was known by the time you made this video. This is like laundering him. Why are you doing this? Quit, wh why are you acting like he's some kind of disengaged troll? He's insincere when he does his shit, but that doesn't mean he doesn't personally hate them. How old is this video? Eight months. Without personally hating them, does that count as hashtag racism? This debate lasts approximately the rest of your goddamn life, which should be evidence enough that the frame is wanting. I, this was not a debate in leftist or even liberal communities, as far as I saw. Like, there was a brief period in like 2016 or 2017 where there were a couple of news items where they sort of tried to launder Milo and Richard Spencer, but pretty immediately the consensus was, yes, they're just full-on racists. This is, that like, I just, I really, this was a debate that was had insincerely with conservatives. Conservatives would argue, he's just a troll, and the left and liberals would argue, no, he's a fascist or a racist or a Nazi or whatever. The argument was not within liberal communities. In today's framing, there are several shades of racism, and there is anti-racism. What about several shades of anti-racism? What about people who support, like, progressive moderate reforms within an electoral system but aren't full-on like lefty socialism pilled are they just part of race is that is it really like that because if that's the case martin luther king jr would be in the racist category because martin luther king jr did advocate for progressive reform even the more radical stuff that he pushed for like reparations would have fit within a broader model of electoral moderate reformist political engagement whereas i'm just guessing by the fact that the person on the left is wearing a mask that they're meant to be like an antifa stand-in the kind of person who believes in radical anti-electoral engagement of anti like uh you know like litigative stuff and if that's the case, like, where's the line? Sorry, man, unless you literally look like this dude, I guess you're a racist now. There is no non. Now, before we map the- Yes, there are non-racist people. This is such a smarmy- This is what I mean by leftist smugness. This is such a smarmy thing to say. The, you can absolutely have people who are not, like, engaged enough with racial politics to be meaningfully on any side. Yes, their participation in the system as a whole still means that their actions will be colored one way or another, no pun intended, but the idea that like, sorry man, you're with us or against us is the worst possible way to win over people. You cannot go over to a person who's not that politically educated and go, oh, you're not aware of how your behavior contributes to the patriarchy and white supremacy? That means you're a racist. You're a racist. You agree with racism. You're on the side of racism. Dude, great, good luck coalition building yeah you're gonna help a lot of minorities with that attitude that like again this isn't just a matter of radicalism the black panther party was willing to do coalitions with and work with people who weren't necessarily sold on black liberation this is why they were so dangerous this is why the fbi wanted fred hampton killed because fred hampton was smart enough to preach in a way that reached across the aisle and tried to win over people who even had significant ideological disagreements. Fred Hampton would have never said, you're with us or you're against us. You have to be the Black Panther Party or you're racist and it's done. That would be ridiculous. That, 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 would, that, would, that doesn't work. That doesn't work.
One last graph, about 1% of people do in excess of 10 political activities a year. Yeah, like it, the idea of if, 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 if our definition of anti-racist is limited to a group of people of this character, then like, great. We, we have like very, very few. Look at this. 1%. Choreography of how these four types interact. First, a quick note on how most white people were white people allowed in the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers was a black org, but they worked with white people all the time to the point of like, direct political collaboration. They, like, the, the, the org itself was a black organization, but they were not opposed to working with white people. And they did so, uh, yeah, the Rainbow Coalition, evenly and, well, like, even-handedly. Rainbow Coalition, thank you, Fred Hampton. I love you. Sorry you died. Black-led organizations use the Rainbow Coalition, an anti-racist, anti-class, multicultural movement founded in 1969 in Chicago, Illinois. Jimenez, uh, 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 after the Young Lords were in the news, 1860 police station, radical socialist groups like Lincoln Park Poor People's Coalition joined nationwide students for a democratic society, the Brown Berets, the American Indian Movement, and the Red Guard Party talked about forming the, um, uh, the Rainbow Coalition. Uh, they eventually collapsed under duress from constant harassment from local and federal law enforcement. Huh. I wonder why the feds were really insistent on breaking up what was probably the origin point of the most powerful, like, multiracial coalition movement to fight against uh, uh, a systemic oppression. What, what was it about them that was so dangerous that the feds got involved? There was a White Panther Party to help the Black Panthers? Yeah. Founded in 1968. It was started in response to an interview where Huey P. Newton was asked what white people could do to support the Black Panthers. Newton replied they could form a White Panther Party. And they worked in the Rainbow Coalition. It's a, it's a silly flag, and I agree. You know, whatever. We're not critiquing the flag. People think about whiteness. Short answer, whenever possible, they prefer not to. It reminds me of this image. Yeah, dude, that's true. That's true. White liberals hate to think about whiteness, man. You definitely can't find constant nonstop efforts to talk about white supremacy in an institutional and academic framework that extends so far up the totem pole that uh, 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 you're getting corporations to bring people in on racial sensitivity training with like Ibram X. Kendi or the, the lady who I don't like. Um, yeah, man, it's true. Liberals are so bad. They're so terrible. Why not just argue that their analysis is lacking? Why not target liberals for the fact that they're weak when it comes to systemic analysis? Why make up this world where liberals don't talk about whiteness? And yes, it always comes down to this meme. All politics is just this meme. Short answer, whenever possible, they prefer not to. Don't you crackle at me, old Whiteness video in America. Footage. Oh, God. Is it vanilla? No. It's fjord de latte. Nothing but milk and sugar. When non-whites are flavors, we are the base. In the same way one does not hear one's own accent. British people have accents. That's not a lot of pots. But we just speak English normal-like. That's not a lot of pots. If you have not built your whole identity around being white, you probably don't think about your whiteness very often. This is true. This is all correct. And perhaps even feel uncomfortable when one points it out. For it is the white experience to passively, unconsciously, conceive of oneself as a kind of raceless default. This is privilege! This video is super smug. Yes, this video is incredibly smug and self-satisfied. My, my biggest critique of Innuendo Studios has always been the fact that these videos are incredibly repellent to people who don't already agree with them. They're insufferable. If you don't come into this already agreeing with the premises of these videos, and thankfully I do, except I, th I think this is his worst video, but apart from that, you know, y yeah, like, it will, it will repel people on so many levels. And maybe he thinks that's okay, and I really just do not think so. Indeed, this is part of what makes privilege privilege. It's the identity that's treated as a norm, the one you don't have to think about. A movie with an all-white cast is widely perceived as being in no way about race. But that's not true of one with an all-black cast. Identities being treated as defaults makes institutional racism difficult to understand even for well-meaning white people. How can I be racist? I think I'm insufferable in a completely different way, thank you. If I don't identify as a racist, how could I be part of a group I never opted into? But let us reflect. Would a group one never opted into not describe a minority? People don't choose to be gay, and while people also don't choose to be straight, being straight is normal. People don't come out to straight. Yeah, I would argue that, uh, like, unironically, I would argue that I managed to tamp down my insufferability, largely by being funny and not too self-serious. These videos are unfunny and deeply self-serious, in addition to being insufferably smug. So I feel like that's kind of a, 
that it's it's a it's a combination of a variety of characteristics. Again, I I think that this channel is worth looking at. I I want to be clear. I think that there are a lot of valuable videos in this channel, but you know. To have complex codes for signaling heterosexuality, not that they'll admit to at least. In lieu of other evidence, straightness is presumed. But if people clock you as gay or even think they'd clock you as gay, then you stand out from the background. It makes you more visible, where the appearance of straightness makes you less so. It makes you the everyman. Of the many identities one may have at any given time on any given axis, there is typically only one default, whose rules operate differently to the rest. The more of these normal identities one possesses, the more accustomed one is to being the default. The idea is foreign that people might group one not by how one thinks of oneself, but by how one is perceived, and by how one impacts others. It gets hard to fathom that any more than whether or not a light-skinned Mexican gets to be white is up to them, whether or not you fit the definition of racist is not up to you. The boundaries are not policed from the inside. Again, I don't disagree with anything in there. I think that's a, a fine bit. So, okay, going again from right to left, this is where we find the titular alt-right. What's novel about the suit and tie ethno-nationalist is how they break from the iconography of racism. Their goal, like that of many racist people, is to attack and oppress people of color, but in such a way that the white establishment lets them get away with it. The average white person's shorthand for a racist is still primarily the Klansman and the neo-Nazi, respectively a rural working-class white nationalism, and an urban working-class white nationalism. The alt-right is the gentrification of white nationalism. This is true to an extent, but it's also outdated. The period of time during which the uh, liberal media was fascinated with this new trend of alt-right ethno-nationalism doesn't mean racial supremacy, it just means we believe in a homeland for our... This is all done. It's done. That, like, liberals have no problem calling Republicans racist right now. Seriously. Like, at all, the, the 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 Democrats broadly are 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 just calling Republicans fascists. It's not. It's it's yeah. This is like from this is like from 2016. I mean, we're watching an old ass video. To be fair, no, we're not. It's from less than a year ago. Stop. Why people keep saying? Well, I know it sounds like it's really old, but it's not. When this video came out, and for years prior, the dynamic here had shifted tremendously, and I don't like promoting the idea that liberals and Democrats are still, like, um, charmed by this uh, double-think alt-right nonsense, you know? I, the, like, the dynamic has shifted, but the insistence on complaining about the liberals as though nothing has changed would suggest to me a, a motivated agenda. Their pocket squares and MBAs and $90 haircuts short out the white moderate's brain because they still associate white supremacy with white trash? Racism is worse than evil. It's common. It's why they insist reactionary conservatism is propped up by the white working class in flyover states, despite all evidence to the contrary. The alt-right can't be as bad as everyone says, because who ever heard of a racist going to Harvard? Okay, to an extent, the classist argument, the idea that racism is considered to be a common, like, white trash thing, that is a thing that has historically been an issue with white liberals' perceptions. The problem, again, is that things have changed. I like the the idea of the Republican Party being a bunch of evil suits who want to reinstate white supremacy. Yeah, it's not. Oh, soaked on left. You're completely correct, by the way. The idea that like the white working class uh, was was acting out of economic anxiety and that's why they voted for Trump. That was like a leftist argument. YouTube chat is saying this is a re-upload. Is that true? H how, from what? From I I don't think that's true. W wouldn't that be mentioned? I d that's not true. That's, that's not true. The alt-right bridges the gap between white nationalism and the rest of white culture using class signifiers to gain access to the political and social capital of the more mainstream collaborators. I feel like I saw this forever ago, dog. That's because the rhetoric in the video is dated and they're using an older example. Can, can we just move on? It also doesn't, like, this is a, a higher level of production quality than he was doing like six years ago and getting the moderate to treat them not as someone to be ignored, but someone to bargain with in good faith. The collaborator finds value in this relationship because regardless of one's- It is, he mentioned it in a community post. Really? He mentioned it in a community post, but he didn't mention it anywhere here in the description of the video. Is that true? Well, well, well let's see. Let's see. By the way, even if this video is old, I think that this rhetoric was wrong then. I think it's outdated now. 
but I think this characterization of liberal behavior and the equation between it or the 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 equating between it and like Milo Yiannopoulos or whatever was wrong then. But here, community post promoting FD signifier. No, there's nothing here in a community post that involve, that in any way relates to that. There are only two community posts. One of them is a promotion of FD signifier, and one of them is from five years ago. So who's saying this? Are you guys like? Are you just lying? Is this a troll? Found it on Tumblr. What? Yeah, right here. September 26, 2022, 10 months ago. The first new alt-right playbook since just after the pandemic began. There, can we move on? Position on it. Racism works. A police officer may clipped not be personally racist, but when it's the end of the month and they need to hand out a few more tickets to make quota, it's safest to do so in a low-income neighborhood where the average driver can't make their life hell by hiring a lawyer. And due to decades of racist redlining, most low-income neighborhoods are disproportionately black and Latine, so... And a prison warden may not be personally racist, but white people are approved by jury selection more often than people who think the justice system itself is racist, so black and Latine... Yeah, he unironically does the Latinx thing. That's how you say Latinx. It's Latine. But I'm not going to say Latine. You could just say Latin or Hispanic, but yes, he actually says that. He unironically says it, yes. People are the easiest to jail, and private prisons get more funding when they're full, so... And a conservative politician may not be personally racist, but Black and Latine people predominantly vote Democrat, and since they're disproportionately imprisoned, if the politician denies convicts the right to vote, they're more likely to get reelected. so... I don't know whether the labor unions and their bosses really hate me. That doesn't matter, but I know I'm not in their unions. I don't know if the real estate lobby is anything against Black over. people, but I know the real estate lobbies keep me in the ghetto. I don't know if the Board of Education hates black people, but I know the textbooks I give my children to read and the schools that we have to go to. Andres, I'm actually going to ban you. Stop with this shit. It's a modern video. It took him a while to make. The video came out. We Stop. Two years ago, it was also outdated. Stop. Now, frequently enough, these people are self-identified, card-carrying racists. My point is, for this system of incentives and rewards to operate, they don't have to be. Any of them may, but none of them must. Racism exists, and it's efficient. And in a capitalist Wait. society where cops are competing for promotions, private prisons are competing for con- Wait, are we done talking about white liberals? Get bored now. I think, so the reason I'm not talking anymore is because I don't disagree with anything that's being said. Our solutions is that we implied the problem was racism. Yes, 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 white people are overrepresented in dozens of industries nationwide, but have you considered that it's a fluke? Pitch me a solution for it being a fluke. The collaborators' white supremacy exists in the negative space. They agree racism exists, get arrested less often, and are typically in position to negotiate with whomever's in power. That this society was built for the everyman, and being the everyman confers power upon you. When children of white moderates get older and- Why shot Vashem? Because if we don't jump around, I'll just end it. First brush up against this definition, wherein white supremacy is not small, but all-encompassing where it can be cruel, but is at least as often indifferent, and where every white person in the country is bound up in it and privileged by it, whether they want to be or not, and will never, ever experience it themselves, where it's not about feelings, but about power. How often do they say, oh, maybe the definition I grew up with was simplified for nine-year-olds? Or, oh, maybe the definition given to me by white grown-ups was less complete than one a black grown-up might have given? That might strike you as odd, given that reactionary conservatives have seen many victories over the last 20 years, and it's not like they did it by winning over us. White supremacists bolster their numbers by finding little disgruntled pockets of America that have not heretofore engaged much in politics, and radicalizing them to the cause and then pitching themselves to white collaborators as a demographic now large enough to sway a narrow election. If moderates wanted to counter this strategy, they might look at who out there is sympathetic to progressive causes but isn't voting, maybe because they don't feel liberal candidates represent them, or maybe because someone just happened to shut down all the polling locations in their neighborhood. And you know, mathematically, there's probably a lot more disenfranchised people of color who match that description than racist white people who aren't already Republicans. But that strategy would mean doubling down on anti-racist talking points instead of easing off of them. It would mean a willingness to alienate some white people. It's giving up on them. I don't, I don't like the idea that there is a, um, there is a dichotomy between appealing to marginalized people and appealing to conservative-leaning people. Because there isn't. And we know there isn't because Bernie Sanders existed. 
well, he still exists. His campaigns existed. There are ways to appeal to both groups. You can placate, pour water on, like, narratives that excite and uh, agitate racists or people who don't think they're racist but kind of are, while also reaching a hand out to the working class and to minority groups. In fact, I think it's pretty easy to do so because in many cases, the underlying problems that both of these groups experience are class determinant. They're working class people. Overwhelmingly, most of America is working class. Uh, they're working class people who face problems which are a product of systems that we all suffer under, regardless of our race. And the Republican strategy is to try to win people over by displacing the anger they feel about their economic marginalization onto race issues. Why is the economy bad? It's because of China. It's because of immigrants. It's because of Mexicans. Why do you feel like shit? Why is everything falling apart? Well, it's not because of the economy or whatever. It's because of trans people, you know? And the Democrats, which have never fully committed at any level to meaningfully addressing these economic problems, you know, can't really do much more than arguing against the rhetoric of the racist than the underlying logic that the racist is trying to supplant with racism. So I think it's pretty easy to appeal to both groups, right? All you have to do is... is drive that line, you know? Racism is just a way that they are distracting you from these real issues. Don't fall for it. We need to commit to them sincerely. And that would also be advocacy, of course, for um, both anti-racism and for uh, uh, class issues. Innuendo Studios wouldn't recognize this because he unironically claimed Bernie was racist. Is that true? Wait, hold on. Is Innuendo Studios, is Innuendo Studios even a leftist? Is he a lib? Am I watching a liberal lib talk at other libs to be the smuggest lib? Libs do the best libbing. I'm trying to find, he called himself a pinko. Yeah, well, people, libs love to do that. I'm trying, I'm trying to find a source for that. Sorry, I can't find anything. Maybe it's not true. We gotta finish up, man. It's admitting that a significant percentage of American whiteness is not on the side of racial equity. It means there's a definition of racism where it isn't fringe, but common and pervasive. I think the point here is that liberals don't do much to appeal to disenfranchised people of color as much as cons do to appeal to racist lull. I agree with that. I just, alongside all the really weird, like, here are the blocks of racist and anti-racist shit that was earlier in the video, I really, really, really hate and am wary of mischaracterizations of liberals because there are so many leftists who are like, desperate to distinguish themselves from liberals by pointing like painting all liberals as like like neocon adjacent clintonites who have absolutely no progressive inclinations and are basically just an enemy when it comes to meaningful change and the, you there leftists who believe that are all over twitter go to twitter right now and find i guarantee you right now there is an active post with more than 10,000 likes which is saying, what's the point in voting for Joe Biden when Tennessee passes anti-trans laws under Joe Biden? Just lefties who are probably 15, who are probably suicidally ideative, who have no understanding of how politics works, who are trying to transfer their low IQ onto the rest of the country, who are like, whose, whose whole personality is not being a liberal, like their parents. There's a lot of this. No one pointed anything Sanders has actually done for black people during his time as office, nor for any specifically race-oriented policies proposed with one of the plans of the surveys. Isn't just being an economic populist itself and not being racist about it far better than any Democrat on race issues? The statement that Warren is better on race than Sanders should not be met with 75% hostility. Okay, it's just soy shit. I don't know. Globe emoji. And where addressing it requires thinking about their place in it. It means asking why they feel more affinity for white people who oppose independently ranked the top candidate on racial justice by two orgs, the root and the center for urban racial equality. Bosh, is it just me, or do you find yourself agreeing with liberals way more often than leftists? Yeah, if only leftists weren't tards, then I wouldn't have to do that so often. I'm not joking, yeah. Liberals, okay, what have American leftists built right now? What do they currently build, maintain, organize, collectivize around? Nothing, they have nothing. They've built nothing. There are little advocacy groups. There are people with a hope for better world. There are people who want to make change, but right now they don't run anything. The world is either liberal or fascist. Those are the two ideologies that exist in an institutional sense in the world right now. And America is... What's that? Soaked on left, you do not want to cite the DSA as an example for leftists being responsible caretakers of a system. Uh, that's, in fact, completely my point. Thank you. Liberals 
have run this country for a long time, you know, in their varying forms. And as a product of being the ideology that is ruled, there are some fairly nuanced and fairly well-developed systems that exist and that have been defended and iterated upon that self-justify. The problem with leftists is that they don't have an example to point to, right? What are you going to point to? China? The Soviet Union? No, no. If you want to make an argument for anything leftist, you're kind of throwing darts at a wall. Not necessarily a bad dart or a bad wall, but you're, ha you're having to work from first principles a little bit. This is why a lot of lefties struggle with electoralism, because electoralism is the bridge that exists right now that gets us from A to B. And bridge building is tough, but imagining the other side of the river is easy. In fact, you can see it from here. It's in your head. The problem is, like, lefties are so desperate to define themselves, to iterate and to build, to make a change, that they come up with a lot of really bad ideas. And I consider myself to be a fairly effective gatekeeper for the worst of them. I do not think leftism can survive in this world if it is defended predominantly by its loudest advocates right now. Because its loudest advocates in America are psychotic idiot children. So yeah. I do find myself agreeing with liberals on a lot of stuff. Not, mind you, because I don't have better ideas than them. I do, and I've argued for them. But because the other ideas that are being thrown their way are so bad that I can't risk the left being pulled down with them, I want you guys to have a better understanding of liberals so you can better critique them. I don't want you to be complacent like the liberal. I want you to know what you're up against. Because otherwise, you run the risk of being one of those internet lefties who will unironically make arguments like, how are Democrats better than Republicans on trans issues when Florida is passing anti-trans bills? That is a real take that I have seen tens of thousands of people like and hundreds of thousands of people see and have burned into their minds. You need to understand the system better than that if you want to meaningfully change it. That's what made Marx a good uh, political advocate, by the way. Marx was not the first person to point out that wealthy people controlling everything was bullshit, you know? He was better at understanding and critiquing the system than any of his contemporaries. That's what defines him, not the fact that he was the first to arrive at those fundamental prescriptive conclusions, because he wasn't, not even... Not even close, not even remotely. So yeah, that's my request. If you're gonna be a lefty and you have change, that you, you, there's, there's, you have ideas on how you wanna bring about differences, you'd better make sure they're good ideas because otherwise you're really just wasting our time and making all of us dumber. ...them than people of color they claim to agree with. Why the votes of the former have to be earned but the latter are expected. And since all that seems intolerable, they fixate on the kinds of gestures that feel like moving in the right direction, but run very little risk of arriving anywhere. How about instead of defunding the police, we give them more money than any administration in years, but also Juneteenth is a national holiday now. Something for everyone. The left has the numbers to leave behind white centrists who slow down anti-racist efforts. And it doesn't. Because I, I, I could do on a ramble about how police budgets are not determined at a federal level and that you're massively oversimplifying the issue by suggesting that there's any relationship between Juneteenth being a national holiday. I could argue that he's like skipping past the fact that Biden has called for a set of policing standards to affect the entire nation. But because policing policy is dictated like at a local level, it's actually really difficult to do that sort of stuff. And that also it's really, really, really difficult to like I, not to again, it's a matter of having the right idea to criticize the problem, you know, but I, but it's complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated. But we all just want simple narratives, simple narratives. Because white moderates don't want to. They and the white collaborators are supposed to be in this together. And they are. No, they're not. This isn't real anymore. Holy shit. The, we, liberal Democrats are not promoting bipartisanship as like a first principle with Republicans. Things are pretty oppositional right now. I think they could be more oppositional. I think that Biden should go on stage and call them all pedophiles. Yes, I agree with that. However, the idea that like, it's, it's the idea that it's like, it's not the 90s anymore. It's not the 90s. I, I agree that there's still an insistence on bipartisanship on some level, but the idea that there's some kind of like overt express goal. The Congress doesn't even pass anything anymore, except for like the occasional uh, economic bill and the budget and stuff. Just not in the way they think. The irony is that the right feels no affinity for white moderates whatsoever. They hate, and I mean hate, white moderates. 
Smug pricks always talking about unity whenever they win an election. Reach across the aisle? That's what you say when you've lost and you want the other guys to make concessions they don't have to make. You don't do it when you're in power. Are they trying to humiliate us? Or did we really lose to a bunch of clowns who- This is completely true, by the way. Conservatives are absolutely contemptuous of the fact that, uh, uh, that, that liberals are like a political opponent to them while being these like buffoons who don't even play the power game the way conservatives try to. Don't even know how to win right, debasing themselves in front of minorities just to get their votes when they clearly aren't going to do anything real for them. Christ, at least the white supremacists are honest. The right but, will threaten POC sometimes just to call the white moderates bluff. Racism must be understood as more than a set of individual beliefs and feelings. This is true. That is true. What he's saying here is true but as a tool for achieving political ends. First and foremost, because claiming otherwise is both factually and morally wrong, but also, without this understanding, white culture can't recognize the stakes. Fascism exists in a state of permanent conflict. Things like declaring an indefinite state of martial law, suspending elections, or executing members of government are justified on the grounds that the people are in danger and need to be protected and mobilized. Now, this isn't unique to fascism. Between the Cold War, the war on drugs, and the war on terror, the U.S. has been in some form of ongoing conflict for the last three generations. But you'll note the Cold War didn't end on a battlefield. It ended when the Soviet Union collapsed in on itself. Communism, terrorism, and drug dealing are patterns of behavior, and they wax and wane, often for reasons outside our control. Geopolitics may someday shift such that terrorism becomes less prevalent, or that lowers the demand for drugs. Communism can be fought with diplomacy and economic sanctions because communists can choose not to be communist anymore. And fascists have no use for soft power. They were never communist. Power. To justify a military dictatorship, they need an opponent that won't just go away on its own one day. It always comes back to identity politics because black people can't stop being black. Theirs is a number that will not be reduced without the hard power of violence and displacement. Fascism begins by stealing targets from the left. They focus on elites, corrupt businessmen, weak-willed politicians, subtly shifting focus This is true. away from leftist critique of systems to types of people. But sooner or later, they settle on something unchangeable. Race, gender, ethnicity, religious background. The bigotry is localized to the region's existing prejudices. In Nazi Germany, it was Jews, Jehovah's Witnesses, Roma, Slavs, black people, queer people, and people with disabilities. In fascist Italy, it was Slovenes, until Mussolini invaded Libya and Ethiopia, and so demonized their citizens as well. In the US, the Klan and the American Nazi Party targeted African Americans, Jews, Catholics, queer people, and immigrants. Spain under Franco tried to determine the exact racial makeup of the Spanish people so they could cast out those with the wrong mixture of bloods. Uh, this is why the far right has gone all in on transphobia, by the way. Like, it's joined Islamophobia on the outer rim of acceptable bigotries. On some level, they I actually, know- I, I actually think that Islamophobia, in a weird way, is kind of done. Oh, so I shouldn't say done, but it's no longer taken a first spot in the, um, the rights, like, target for fear-mongering, in part because we've gotten further and further from 9-11, so that, you know, the, the fear-mongering, you know, doesn't- Yes, I'm talking about America, not Europe. But over in America, in a, like, I've mostly seen praise from Muslims. Like, Andrew Tate is doing the fake Muslim thing. Aiden Ross as well. The, like, Dubai shit. Saudi Arabia financing a lot of conservative shit over here. I think that, like, we're, we're doing... There's, there's a lot of this, like, ca Catholics, Orthodox, Christians, and uh, Islamic nation-states linking arms in the global war against degeneracy. You know what I mean? Remember when Lauren Chen was like, let's talk about dank Taliban memes when the Taliban reconquered Afghanistan? I just see a weird amount of praise of Islam from conservatives these days. It's not like they meaningfully disagree on much. Oh, trans folks aren't just cis people in disguise. That desistance is rare and conversion therapy doesn't work. Because if trans people could just stop being trans, they never would have picked them for an enemy. This is where it starts. This is why you should have no patience for anyone saying wokeness is dividing the left. We should be focusing on class. They're not Agreed. attacking us on class. They're trying to sell themselves as better on class than we are. Where do you think that fairy tale about blue collar whites comes from? They want you to believe that they, and not the socialists, are the path forward for the downtrodden. There's a reason fascism started popping up all over Europe. See, this is why he isn't a tanky. 
um, tankies wouldn't make statements like this. Um, because tankies are usually all too willing to fall for narratives like that. Like I said, I really do like the videos in this guy's channel, even if he's a bit of a soy lord. It's just this one video rubbed me the wrong way, which is why I went over it. I recommend you guys look at it. They're like rhetoric-focused videos. Right after the Russian Revolution, Mussolini got his start beating up socialists in the Po Valley, on the grounds that he was defending not wealthy elites, but struggling rural farmers who didn't like the socialist takeover of their industry during the Bienio Rosso. The fascist goal is to harness and redirect class resentment towards a scapegoat. They come at us on identity. It always comes down to the shape of the human skull. When a provocateur shows up on a college campus to talk about ideas, it's not a debate. There's no special sequence of words that will defeat them. This is true. This is a show of dominance. They are presenting themselves as white compatriots to be reasoned with, rather than agents of white supremacy to be opposed. In that framing, the stakes are attention, the weapons are words, and people of color are not players, but tokens on a white person's game board. No, they're, they are both players and tokens. The idea that they're the subject being discussed... First of all, Milo Yiannopoulos and the people that this abstract representation are meant to target also attack white people. It's not just... Like, the, the idea that it's, like, exclusively a discussion of minority groups and not a broader attack on left principles, values, and behavior that includes advocacy for minorities is ridiculous. So, no, minorities are not just the... Um, the ball that's being played with. They are participants and they are also victims of the game, for sure. But yeah, they, they absolutely are a part of this. And they are checking whether you will submit to that structure. They don't care about ideas. They care about power. And power is what beats them. They tell you 400 people showing up to protest is just free news coverage. But when 4,000 show up, they cancel. That's power. That's not necessarily true. First of all, getting 4,000 people together, like, what? so what do you do if you try to mount an opposition or a counter-protest, and then you only have a couple hundred people? Do you cancel? Because now that makes you look really weak. Like, that's, this is the problem. The idea of, like, yeah, well, we can demonstrate power, and all we have to do is be far more powerful than them every time. Yes? But what if you don't? Not to mention, having to cancel because mobs of thousands of far-left student protesters showed up? is basically just giving you the narrative that you want. Milo Yiannopoulos wanted that narrative. I had to not show up due to threats of violence. The police wouldn't let me. They said it was too dangerous for me. Look at how intolerant these college campuses are. I'm sorry. I think this makes things more dangerous for um, the minorities who are present at that college. Because then I think that Milo Yiannopoulos, now that he has a ton of media attention on him because he just got like forced out of Berkeley, can go and say, you know, ah, yeah, and it's all this and that group. And what about this? And what about that? And then go on social media and post pre-transition trans photos or post immigrant info or whatever else. Bosh, is this how you felt back then or have you evolved on this? I felt differently back then. I would have agreed with Innuendo Studios five years ago. And I've changed my mind. Because you know what? I was here for all of it. And it never worked! We never got what we wanted! Every single time there was any kind of Antifa versus conservative battle on college campuses, it would always work out better for them. Because they knew how to consolidate their media apparatus and hyperfixate on promoting the person who was going to speak at the event. You'd have, um, uh, um, uh, you'd have, um, Andy No show up and take, like, edited videos to promote the lie that it was actually the far left that was being violent there. A bunch of people would get hurt anyway. We'd have victim narratives that would carry on for years. And how much, how much media attention were, 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 was like meaningfully directed in a positive way towards the left? I would argue very little because the people that the right are trying to win over are affected by the narrative of violent students at Berkeley ousting Milo Yiannopoulos. But the people the left are trying to win over, a huge broad plurality of moderate and liberal voters, are not inspired by images of radical student protesters knocking over trash cans or menacing people from a black block at Berkeley. It's not an effective angle for us. Because we can't play the victimization line as effectively as they can when we're showing up to protest their speech, even if it's disingenuous, because obviously the speech is incendiary uh, and, and, and meant to instigate violence from their perspective. 
No, I, I genuinely believe. Yeah, like SDL says, Vosh, anecdotally, after the Battle of Berkeley, for around two years, I constantly heard about Antifa violence and bike locks, even as white nationalists did dozens of shooting a year. I just, I just don't think it worked, okay? Conservative media will consolidate to defend Milo Yiannopoulos. Leftist and liberal media will not consolidate to defend random bike lock Antifa guy. It just doesn't work in our favor. I really do think that the best, um, I really do think that the best, uh, way to deal with stuff like that is to just ignore it. I know that sounds insane, but keep in mind that, like, their provocateurs, that is the one place they want us to focus. Like, I'm not saying ignore white supremacy. Milo's whole job was to get our attention. This is the one place where we know for an absolute fact that they benefit from attention because they're saying they do. So here specifically, we shouldn't grant it. But, you know, I can't control groups of student protesters. What about tearing down their flyers and spreading counter info? Sure. Yeah, fine. Yeah, sure. Whatever. Then we should do the same. We should build a media apparatus that disarms the narratives. No? Yeah, good luck with that. Go. Yeah. You and what billions of dollars? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. Like, that, that's up there with, like, you know, well, what if we just did communism? Then it wouldn't be an issue. I agree. Are you effectively saying the idea of a constructive college debate for the left with these white nationalists is impossible? Well, wait, wait, wait. First of all, Milo wasn't doing debates. He was just speaking from a podium. Second of all, no, there's nothing you could say to a person like Milo in a college debate setting that would in any way benefit your cause. He is a troll. He's a troll who believes the worst versions of what he says, but he's still a troll. What? Also, don't dignify him with the engagement. I would be willing to have a conversation with something like, I don't know, Nick Fuentes. If he called into the stream, I called him a gay retard, and then like we, we yelled at each other for 15 minutes before I, I kicked him. That's a, fine, that's, that's a level of respect and engagement that I think is proportioned to his IQ and his worth as a human. But I wouldn't like sit down in like a cozy seat at Harvard to talk with him and like allow him to intellectualize his anti-intellectual positions. The guy's literally said he doesn't believe in evidence if it disagrees with him because that means the Jews made it. What argument is there to be had? All you can do is make fun of him. But you can't make fun of somebody like Milo when you're at a college debate because that setting implies a degree of civility and mutual respect, which is just not present here. Teal Josh, I'm fine with the counter protests at Charlottesville. That wasn't a provocateur showing up at a college campus. Do you think Destiny is wrong to debate Fuentes the way he does? No, I think that Destiny going on Cozy TV and talking to Fuentes 50,000 times and like doing stuff together um, has been great for the overall advancement of progressivism and uh, proletarian uh, democracy. Anyway, I'm not against counter protesting. I'm just saying for specifically for people like Milo Yiannopoulos, like the whole game is can he bait you into engaging? And like he did over and over. The only reason Milo's career took a downward turn is because he isolated himself from other right-wing allies and admitted to being a pedophile. Spencer stopped touring uh, campuses because of Antifa. Yeah, but like Richard Spencer stopped being relevant before this happened is the problem. Richard Spencer was a flash in the pan. He got like a CNN thing. And then after that, it was a rapid downward turn. This is why right now, if you go on Richard Spencer's like Twitter page or whatever, he has got like no engagement and he's supporting Joe Biden. He doesn't, he's, this isn't like representative and he wasn't that kind of provocateur. He tried to be one, but he's, he, he, he wasn't good at it. Too emotionally unstable. Also, have you considered the possibility that when he says Antifa is what made his rallies not fun anymore, that he might be lying? That it might just be the fact that not enough people were showing up and people didn't care about what he had to say? And rather than admitting to the public, I don't want to do this anymore because nobody gives a shit about me, he instead said, oh yeah, the Antifa groups are making this less fun? Like, you think the professional liar might be lying? Again, I'm fine with counter-protesting, it's just like the one time you shouldn't, man. But I've already made my complaints about Antifa. I guess people shouldn't protest turf academics when, uh, then when they speak. That really depends. Why? Stop ascribing. Don't. Listen, if you're going to step to me, better make sure you understand what I believe, okay? Sometimes I think counter-protesting turfs is good. A lot of people who promote the turf ideology are not open trolls in the sense that, like Milo, they will just flippantly lie and threaten people the way that he did. A lot of them actually do believe the words they're saying and will attempt to be an earnest advocate for it. When people are engaging in earnest advocacy, earnest counter-protest is almost always effective, like uniformly so. 
Because in that case, you're not playing into a system that has been designed exclusively to benefit from the provocateur. There are sometimes provocateurs, like Posey Parker. Posey Parker's little bit in, say, New Zealand, and no, in Australia, got her in a lot of trouble. But here's the thing, folks. What led to Posey Parker getting a lot of negative reception in Australia? Was it the counter-protest, or was it her supporters? The thing that got her ousted. Oh, no, was it, was it, uh, yeah, no, it was Australia. The thing that got her in a lot of trouble was because Nazis showed up and Sieg heiled right outside. She got in a lot of trouble there because it was really evident that she was politically aligned with Nazis. It wasn't because people protested against her. It wasn't because people showed up and yelled at her. It was because she was just in a big open road with Nazis. That was what did her in. Well, it didn't do her in. She's still a very prominent um, advocate for killing trans people, and she's still a hateful monster. But it was definitely a huge setback, and it led to a lot of both infighting with it. Go watch uh, Sean's video on um, on uh, Posey Parker and her relationship to Nazis. It talks about it very, very well. Yeah, see, what's more destructive to your movement as a person, quote-unquote, advocating for women's rights? A hundred trans women showing up to protest, or ten of these guys showing up to support you? You know the answer. Power is complicated, and navigating the media relationship is even more complicated. You know, understanding how to best promote your ideology, how to, how to get people on your side, it's tough, you know? And the problem is, is that the kinds of people that we're trying to support, uh, or not support, we're trying to get the support of, liberals, moderates, the common man, right? They get scared off by stuff conservatives don't. Conservatives will support Milo Yiannopoulos after Milo Yiannopoulos threatens to dox trans people or whatever. But liberals will not support leftists who get in trouble for bike lock hitting somebody at a protest, like a fascist or whatever. It's a different game, and it's not fair, but we have to know how to play it. Because if we don't know how to play the game, we lose. And if we lose, we all die. So listen up, okay? You do not want to fall into the, 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 the trap of believing you're playing the same game. I've said this many times, but if you really want to look good versus the far right, don't show up in a black block. Don't show up as Antifa. If you show up as Antifa, you look just as scary to the average voter as the far right people. You even look scarier. At least a lot of them are showing their faces. You're in all black, like some kind of tactical camo warrior. What are you doing? Show up with a crowd full of people who look normal and show up with 10 times as many people. That's how you win. Show up as a bunch of dad grillers. You want to show you want to show up like you're like you you came here for a barbecue, okay? Listen, there is not a single conservative protest on earth that could survive 1000 dads showing up in this t-shirt. I'm not joking. Vosh, you don't understand. These Nazis are the Kiwi farm types who would profile activists. Why do you patronize me? You think I don't know? You think I haven't dealt with it? I'm aware. They are not going to First of all, the idea that showing up in Antifa or Black Block protects you from being doxxed is not true. For second, okay, you are far less likely to get doxxed if you're just a crowd of a thousand normal looking people who are all chanting from one side, okay? You, the people who get doxxed by Kiwi Farms are the people who identify and distinguish themselves to the point that they can motivate a bunch of internet virgins to, um, to, 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 uh, like target them. If, if it's literally just a bunch of, like, just a crowd of people that are all just counter-protesting, it's way harder to focus on, oh, do we, do we target and dox the 43-year-old dad wearing this t-shirt, you know? Or do we target and dox the, the, the one in the teal t-shirt, you know? Like, it's, it's, it's different. Let's just end the video. And in absolute numbers, most events, they can't rustle up 4,000 supporters. But we can provided cishet non-disabled white dude lefties like myself haven't told all the right's biggest targets that their struggles don't matter. Too ma Wait, hold on. Too many words, SDL, I can't read. He can, provided cishet non-disabled white dude lefties like myself haven't told all the right's biggest targets that their struggles don't matter. And yeah, dude, that's definitely something that was happening in Berkeley in 2016. It was a bunch of white cis men telling minority groups their struggles don't... That's de that's definitely what they were doing at these protests to Milo Yiannopoulos. They were all doing, like, yeah, man, I'm gonna show up in Black Block and protest a fascist, but also, let me tell you... Come on. J again, just, like, making shit up. And it's worth mentioning, cops f*** with protesters less when some of them are white. It's also worth mentioning... Ra that's true. Racism affects 58% of the working poor, so there can be no class solidarity that doesn't address it. True. This isn't who needs to win. This is who needs to win. Okay, this is this is just a 
degree of political analysis that is completely detached from reality. Um, the idea that real racial politics means not working when when what for who for what goal does this guy know that like 90 percent of black americans who vote vote for democrats are they all white moderates as well because they support those white moderates politically like if you let black people win like you let them be the dominant voice they'll just go and vote for joe biden again that's what they're currently voting for it's just i whatever and if you're white you need to be over here I've collected as many resources as I can find by POC on what they need and want uh, from white allies and put them in the down there part. Don't read them. There's a plurality of opinions on this, so I recommend reading more than one. And it may not always be a 4,000 strong protest. Every direct action is unique and must be strategized in concert with the people most affected. But what I can tell you is when business gets done, white folks need to split the check. A movement cannot be anti-fascist if it isn't anti-racist. Okay. I, it's just so funny because I'm remembering all those crowds of student protesters in Black Bloc who were like actively fighting the all right at Berkeley and a lot of them were white. Like most of them were white. I don't, the idea that it's all like queer black people out there fighting against the fascists and like white people are all going like, eh, you know, just, you know, he meant as like folks with an X. Yeah. Again, unironically, I, I know that this guy hates me and that there were problems with the video and blah, blah. But I've watched every video in this channel, even though a lot of them don't show that I've played them because I lo watched a lot of them like a while ago. And they are genuinely very, very good. Like these little, these bits right here are just like rhetorical snippets that talk about very specific like political dynamics. And uh, they're, they're short and I think they're like really good. So I strongly suggest you take a look at them. I mean it, okay? I think that was his worst video and the rest of them I would consider to be probably among the best in terms of rhetorical analysis on YouTube. Okay? You understand? You understand? He's at his best when he's talking about the dynamic of conservatives and fascists, which he does most of the time, almost all the time, in fact, and it's good. I think he lost the plot a bit during COVID-19. I think he got COVID madness is why this one is worse than previous ones. But these two are excellent. I haven't seen Protagony 2 Abed, so. Okay, didn't this guy call you a pedo? Everyone who hates me calls me a pedo. But just because they hate me and are therefore bad does not mean that there isn't value which can be taken from their videos. I've always advocated, like for instance, Sean, I think is a bad person, legitimately like a bad person, but he makes phenomenal videos. So go watch them, right? Which should, should you not go watch, you know, a, 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 a movie or a, he struggles with mental health and is doing better than he used to. He still suffers from VDS, which I think we can agree is by far the worst mental condition a person can have. Oh God, I forgot. I've been streaming for like five years. There are new people who watch sometimes. Holy shit. I have to, like, re-explain things. He's a smarmy, patronizing, cowardly piece of shit who talks down to literally everyone he disagrees with. He was also one of the people who was bullying and egging on Lindsay Ellis to leave YouTube when people were mass harassing her over literally nothing. Uh, Sean was making snide comments about her being a racist uh, when she absolutely was not. He just generally seems like the kind of person whose first, like, personal principle is being smug and right around others, and apart from that, he doesn't give a shit. I also remember fervently... Oh, that's right. He had a grudge with Lindsay Ellis because when he was saying that people shouldn't vote uh, blue in 2020, Lindsay Ellis was like, holy shit, dude, we're literally dying over here, please. Like, we need Trump to lose to Biden. And, and Sean was, like, a huge asshole about it and, like, didn't back off. And I think he always held a, a grudge with her, and that's why he kind of egged her on to uh, leave the platform. Anyway, Sean's a bad guy. Tell us how you really feel, Vosh. I like Lindsay Ellis's videos, and I miss them. She's on Nebula. I should get Nebula. I should get Nebula. I should. Do you think Lindsay Ellis is a good person? I, I, oh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I just think that Sean is, like, a noteworthily bad person. Like, he's distinguished himself to me. Like, Contra doesn't like me, but I don't think Contra's a bad person. I just think she has kind of, like, little little drama mongery, maybe. A little, a little holds martini glass, sneers at you. A little, uh, you go, girl, queen, yes. I don't know. Um, whatever. She's smart. She makes good videos when she makes videos. Um, and disliking me isn't exactly a rare trait, so I'm not gonna get too up in arms about it. We could go over every single leftist YouTuber who hates me, and we could, like, one by one analyze their moral character, but I think my... It's Sean in particular who I have a huge beef with. Uh, that behavior with Lindsay Ellis was just, uh, really bad. Oh, right, yeah, no, Sean is, like, a total class reductionist. Said Trump was an average president. I remember, I remember.